so we stopped here. Um, let me just go over the gist of what we have done so far. Essentially, we are making making a flame sheet assumption in this problem of co-flowing a fuel and oxidizer at uh, the same velocity, and uh, um, so the flame sheet assumption basically is a infinite trait chemistry assumption or infinite kinetics, uh, and uh, that basically boils down to the mixing problem. And we adopt this notion called the mixed is burnt approach um, <clears throat> as far as this this uh, solution is concerned. So if you now solve only the mixing problem, all we need to do is to locate the stoichiometric, stoichiometric surface in order to get the flame shape. So we just take the fuel and oxidizer species conservation equations in the schwab zeldovich formulation and uh, form the uh, alphas corresponding to them for a one step chemistry of nu f f plus nu o gives p and uh, and then of course you you also manipulate the right hand side to look the same in these two equations in for alpha and then you now have the schwab zeldovich uh, coupling function beta that is formed as alpha f minus alpha o and uh, then you get a homogeneous linear equation for uh, beta and if you now um, uh, unwrap this vector equation uh, sorry vector calculus equation in terms of uh, or vector, vector in, in this equation in terms of vector identities uh, uh, in in terms of cylindrical polar coordinates uh, and then we also have the fourth assumption that we listed which is to uh, neglect axial diffusion in preference preference to um, radial diffusion then we are left with uh, these two terms. So these two terms basically signify the balance between axial convection and radial diffusion. So essentially the governing equation boils down to this particular balance that we have been discussing that dictates the flame shape. Uh, we will talk about uh, pretty soon we will talk about what is the consequence of retaining axial diffusion as well um, uh, but let us just proceed. Uh, this equation now is first order in Z and to second order in R that means it requires one boundary condition in Z and two boundary conditions in R and uh, more, moreover since uh, the boundary conditions that we can supply are at least to uh, at most to one order less than the leading order. So the leading order here is second order in R that means we can supply boundary conditions in the value of beta or its derivative its first derivative. Uh, and the, the first derivative in beta signifies diffusion mass flux because if you now go back and see beta is alpha f minus alpha o alpha alphas are basically y i's uh, with the normalization uh, therefore uh, a derivative in a first derivative in beta will essentially boil down to indicating a first derivative in y i's which essentially means diffusion mass flux um, in terms of the fixed law to which we have reduced the schwab zeldovich formulation. And, uh, since the the the, uh, um, the z boundary condition is only to first order, we can supply boundary conditions only in the value. We can't supply boundary conditions in the derivative. This is going to be pretty important for us to think about when we start looking at retaining axial diffusion uh, sometime later. But at this stage, we we are recognizing that we need to have two boundary conditions, either in the value or derivative for uh, beta in R uh, uh, two, two boundaries of R which are R equal to 0 and R equal to B. R equal to 0 is the center line, R equal to B is the uh, outer, diam outer duct radius and in both the cases it turns out of course this is a Neumann boundary condition uh, required uh, for symmetry and this is a no mass flux penetrating the wall because the wall is a rigid wall, uh, it is a, a non porous wall and you are not looking at any uh, penetration of uh, mass by diffusion there therefore these are the boundary conditions and uh, we can um, look at boundary conditions the first derivative. Now if you now have these two boundaries uh, uh, subjected to Neumann boundary conditions we have to make sure that the other boundary that we are looking at which is z equal to 0 uh, for the z boundary um, is provided with the Dirichlet condition and that is what is actually required okay you cannot provide a Neumann boundary condition. But when you now think about a axial diffusion taken into account you will also have a second order in Z which will admit two boundary conditions up to first order in beta but at that stage we cannot give Neumann boundary conditions everywhere then you will have a non unique solution therefore we will think about the kind of boundary conditions admitted in that case next. But at this stage 
we, we, we can only provide Dirichlet boundary conditions uh, for this uh, and in beta so uh, need 1 BC in Z at Z equal to 0. Uh, so at Z equal to 0 which is a Dirichlet uh, data which should be in the form of Dirichlet data so at, at, at uh, Z equal to 0 we have to now say what should be the value of beta right. So we, we now have to go back and look at how to form our beta, beta is alpha F minus alpha O right and uh, what we find is if you are now looking at Z equal to 0 that is at the at the same plane as the lip of the inner duct where the fuel is coming in and beginning to mix with the oxidizer from the outer duct. So and we have to now look at how this um, the beta should span from 0 to um, B across R equal to uh, A. So what we find is between 0 uh, R equals 0 and R equals A you have only fuel at a mass fraction of Y of naught and you do not have any oxidizer therefore your YO is 0 and uh, your uh, uh, therefore alpha O is 0. So if alpha O is 0 you only are left with alpha F so beta, uh, beta would be um, <coughs> YF naught divided by WF nu F right uh, with, with a negative sign because uh, you, you have a uh, new new i single prime is new f and you have a denominator new i double prime minus new i single prime new i double prime is 0 so you have a negative sign over here therefore we are going to get a negative sign there uh, this is for uh, 0 less than r less than a. Now if you now go back to what happens between r equal to a to r equals b you have all oxidizer that means you have a y o naught uh, over here but you have yf naught is 0 right. So if you now go back and see uh, your alpha o will be alpha o naught and uh, uh, your al um, alpha, alpha f would be 0 alright. So if you now plug alpha f equal to 0 and alpha o is equal to alpha o naught and alpha o naught is nothing but y o naught divided by w o nu o with a negative sign uh, and then you have a negative sign here as well right. So therefore you will get a plus y o naught divided by w o nu o this is for r a less than r less than b. So what this really means is uh, you have now a jump in the value of beta at r equal to a alright it is it is it is it is uh, it is discontinuous but that is exactly what the mixing problem is all about you, you have all fuel on one side you have all oxidizer on the other side and they are now going to begin to mix right. So and the mixing is essentially by diffusion and diffusion is essentially a transport process and, and like any, any other transport phenomena the job of diffusion is to mix things and even out discontinuities right. So it is okay to admit discontinuities at the uh, boundary. So what is going to happen is you have all fuel all oxidizer so the beta is discontinuous at the boundary but as you now get into the domain the job of this um, governing equation particularly this term is to even out or smoothen out this discontinuity alright. So that is alright. So considering uh, that uh, we, we have these boundary conditions the next step that we want to do is to non-dimensionalize. non dimensionalize this equation now many times as, as a student you feel uh, that this is this kind of a burden like why, why would I want to do that can I can, can I just uh, go ahead and solve this right away the answer is um, sometimes non dimensional non dimensionalization is done for elegance so your governing equation will look very very nice as if it has been to a hairdresser. Uh, the other times most 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 important technical uh, reason is for, from an engineering point of view is 
you can now actually come up with non-dimensional parameters and uh, the non-dimensional parameters are essentially a group of quantities so which, which are now grouped together in such a way that it is okay to vary one of them and not necessarily the other uh, or you can vary, vary them in combination so that the non-dimensional number is, uh, is, is remaining constant and so on. So you can begin to see how the different parameters that are in the actual problem can group together in, in influencing the solution and the solution that you obtain could be just obtained for one value of the parameter as a whole, non-dimensional non parameter as a whole. You do not have to do, de de do this for many different parameters which are, non which are not non-dimensionalized. So uh, it is pretty uh, good here to basically say that let us now say psi equals um, R divided by B. Now because you have a characteristic length scale in the R direction, you can non-dimensionalize by that. Unfortunately in this problem since you have neglected um, radio, uh, axial diffusion, right, a neglected axial diffusion, it is a infinitely long duct. So you pretty much uh, do not have a good length scale corresponding to the radial, the, the, the axial direction, it is it's almost infinite, right. So what you are basically looking for is what is the diffusion length scale because that is the pro pro process that we are basically looking at. In fact what we should be looking at is what is the competition between diffusion and convection or how fast are we able to diffuse as we are convecting. Okay, it is kind of like a race between the two. The question is how much could I have diffused out how this way while I am convecting at a particular rate. That is now going to give me a certain length scale associated with this, right. So that is going to be made by saying if I now have my eta equals z, um, um, let us say z by u divided by b squared over d, right. So z by u is essentially a, a convective length scale and b squared by d, keep in mind d has the units of like meter squared per second, right. So b squared has meters, squared, uh, meter squared therefore this has a units of time, right. And uh, so z by u also has units of time and therefore eta becomes non-dimensional. But in this the only variable is z, okay. So the farther you go and as you convect, you know how you are the, the more time you are taking but in this time you are also diffusing this way that is because b, b is the length scale corresponding to diffusion because the diffusion is predominantly radial, right. So if, if you want to put these two together then this is uh, the zd divided by ub squared. As a matter of fact you could begin to think about this as if I were to say I do not know any of this, let us say I am not, I'm not uh, interested in thinking about uh, the, the actual problem, the, the professor asked me to non-dimensionalize, I see B as my uh, parameter, the, the length scale here and that fitted in fairly well with psi, why can't you do, do the same thing with eta, uh, I would like to think of this as just z by B, then you have all the stuff sticking out which is essentially d divided by u b. Now u b divided by d essentially is the counterpart of your Reynolds number that you would use in, in momentum mixing but here this is species mixing. So you would actually have to use the Peclé mass transfer number which is the corresponding part of this. So this is 1, a, 1 over Peclé where P e is u b divided by d. right. So from here we can begin to think if Peclé is kind of small all right then eta becomes proportionately larger okay. So Peclé small is basically meaning that you have less convection relative to diffusion okay. So you would expect that you have more and more diffusion happening this way but less convection happening that way. So you should actually be able to get your flame to be shorter. So that is what you should expect for smaller Peclé numbers 
because you are not going too far along the convective path uh, rather you are diffusing. So your, your flame should all be confined to closer to the burner because you have diffused a lot therefore a, a smaller Peclé number will correspond to a, a, a shorter flame effectively and we are trying to cover the shorter flame by artificially blowing up the eta having this 1 over Peclé there essentially so effectively this takes into account the, the, that effect. Uh, but your governing equations do not take into account axial diffusion so that is something that you have to keep in mind that is what should really make the flame shorter strictly speaking how the governing equation turns out to be. Further uh, you, can, you can form some more non dimensional parameters let C be equal to A by B and I will, I will uh, make a big deal about this uh, and the next one which is new equals um, alpha O naught divided by alpha F naught okay alpha O naught divided by alpha F naught if you want to now go back and see what those are um, this is nothing but uh, alpha F naught would be Y F naught divided by W I nu I with a negative sign alpha O naught would be Y F naught Y O naught divided by W O nu O with a negative sign. So the negative signs cancel each other all you are going to again be de dealing with is Y uh, O naught divided by W O nu O divided by Y F naught divided by W F nu F all right and we, we will come back to this this and this quite soon. We have non dimensionalized R we have non dimensionalized Z and then we have a couple of now new non dimensional parameters in the problem but we have not non dimensionalized beta okay. So let gamma be equal to beta divided by alpha F naught. That is to say if you now were to basically go back and say alpha, we just have to pick one of those two right we just pick alpha f naught so beta divided by alpha f naught would be alpha f divided by alpha f naught minus alpha o divided by alpha o naught is what we are going to so o alpha o, o alpha f naught okay. So you just have a alpha f naught in the, in the denominator just to go, go with this you can also see that this goes with this here we have divided alpha f naught in the denominator therefore we are using this so the, the way the new is defined is how the way gamma is also defined okay. Now the interesting thing if you now do all these things uh, the governing equation then becomes then becomes do do gamma by do eta equals 1 over psi do by do psi of psi do gamma by do psi. So essentially we got rid of u by d completely all right so that is because that information is actually buried in eta if we have scaled our eta corresponding to the competition between axial convection and radial diffusion that is what this signifies right. So we, we now have a very nice looking equation without any parameters so this solution is now going to give you uh, so th 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 this equation is now going to give you a solution without any parameters except the boundary conditions are now going to carry some parameters. So what are they uh, the boundary conditions are the non dimensional boundary conditions are um, so now we have to write in terms of gamma so gamma equals uh, well um, let us first write the Neumann bcs for uh, uh, psi that is very very easy at uh, psi equal to 0 we have do gamma by do uh, uh, log psi equal to 0 
and uh, at uh, xi equals 1 we have uh, dou gamma by dou xi equal to 0 for all e to greater than 0 right in fact we should have gone back and said right here uh, for all z greater than 0 that that is true for the entire domain for the route then uh, so this this is the boundary condition uh, for psi in so for gamma in psi but what happens to gamma in uh, eta right so and gamma we now have to translate this boundary condition in non dimensional form that simply turns out to be 1 recall we can um, uh, this is basically uh, this is basically alpha f naught okay and then we just form a, a gamma by dividing by alpha f naught so we need to get a uh, do we do we have a negative sign uh, do, do, with the negative sign is alpha f naught okay so with the negative sign is alpha f naught and we just divide by alpha f naught therefore you simply get a 1 and uh, Similarly, if you now go back and plug in here, this is actually minus alpha O naught, okay, with with the, with the positive sign. This is minus alpha O naught, and then for trying to find the gamma, you divide by alpha F naught. So minus alpha O naught divided by alpha F naught is nothing but minus nu. Okay, but when where are they? We can now write this is actually a zero less than psi less than c c less than psi less than 1. So even though your governing equation did not have any parameters there are a couple of parameters that have crept into the problem in terms of nu and c through the boundary conditions all right and this is going to be very very important in fact this is actually only one boundary that is set at uh, at eta equal to 0 right basically that is the boundary that is that, that is describing the problem for you if you did not have fuel and oxidizer initially unmixed entering the domain at eta equal to 0 you did not have a problem okay so this essentially tells you that the fuel and oxidizer are in as they enter the domain are unmixed and that is what the problem is. So all the parameters in the problem are now reduced to just these two okay. So with this I am not going to derive the solution for you and I am going to assume that you know how to how to derive this okay and, and the way to do this is you, you, you seek a product solution that means you now say gamma is a function of uh, gamma is now a product of two functions uh, one function which is a function only of psi another function that is a function only of eta so you now have um, let us say seek seek a product solution of the form let us suppose gamma equal to some some function chi that is only a function of uh, psi and another function let us say uh, I do not know uh, uh, what is a good symbol well, you could just, just go back with Anglo-Saxon variable so we can simply say capital X of psi and capital Y of eta all right. So if you did this plug it back, back in here go through the product solution approach and uh, substitute these boundary conditions uh, noting that you are expecting to have uh, um, a periodic solution in psi because you have homogeneous boundary conditions there this is a inhomogeneous boundary condition here so you are not expecting periodic solution in, in uh, eta and so on you do all those things and you can now find the solution to be the solution is uh, 
gamma equal to 1 plus nu c squared minus nu plus twice of uh, 1 plus nu times c summation n equal to 1 to infinity that means it takes integer values 1 over phi n j1 of c phi n divided by j0 of phi n squared times j0 phi n psi e to the minus phi n squared eta. I do not even understand this right well let us let us just go step by step I mean of course we are not as intelligent as we would like us ourselves to be. So all these things are something that we have seen okay these are part of the parameters of the problem. The first time we encounter a problem now is what is phi n so phi n is what is called as the nth 0 of uh, j1 of phi where j1 is is a bezel function right. So that is a bezel's function of first order so obviously then j0 is the bezel's function of 0th order right. Now what is bezel's functions bezel's functions are those that look like sines and cosines in fact j0 and j1 will look like sines and cosines except that they do not have a constant amplitude. So you will now find that they kind of keep decaying but keep alternating about the horizontal axis right. So that is the kind of um, solution that you are going to get and you now have a summation over a series of those. So phi naught uh, sorry phi n being the nth 0 of uh, j1 of phi essentially means that this function keeps on alternating up and down about the horizontal axis at specific values of phi the argument right. So when you say zeros, those are the values so where, are, where all do you have the j's going to 0 is essentially where, where, where you get these values of phi okay. So it is kind of like in sin, sines and cosines if you take a sine wave you know that the sine wave passes 0 at 0 pi, 0 pi 2 pi 3 pi 4 pi and so on so th those are the zeros of uh, this the, the sine function. So similarly we will have these what will happen is you will find that these are not actually equally spaced they, they, they have a certain uh, pattern all right so that is how the Bessel's function behaves and typically we get into a Bessel's function mainly because you are having this kind of a derivative for cylindrical polar coordinates and that is mainly uh, because we are using axisymmetric pipes okay. So if in, instead if you now had like vertical plates uh, like channels right you will you will not have a complicated looking derivative uh, for the um, Laplacian you will simply have uh, a partial squared beta divided by partial squared or partial squared gamma divided by partial squared psi by partial psi squared and uh, you will get sines, sines and cosines and typically for these kinds of boundary conditions you should get cosine a, a cosine function here and that would actually imply that we are fitting strictly speaking what, what it really means is we are fitting this particular discontinuity by a Fourier uh, expansion and then letting the Fourier expansion uh, decay okay. So essentially you now have a step that is represented by a Fourier series and then it is subjected to boundary conditions of Neumann BCs on either side and then as you keep on mixing more and more this, the, this particular function now changes. And then the essentially the, 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 the Fourier representation keeps changing as you, as you go along until you get a more and more uniform uh, variation in, in the mixed diffraction. Uh, in the in instead of a Fourier uh, uh, series you now have a series that is based on uh, Bessel's functions and that is possible any time you have you are looking at functions that are orthogonal to each other like in terms of sines and cosines you will have orthogonality. Uh, in, in, in Bessel's function also you have orthogonality so based on these you can actually form series that look like a Fourier series but not necessarily in sines and cosines but some other orthogonal basis functions that is what we have done here 
okay or that is how it comes out to be in the, when, when you now pursue the product solution. How do you know it is a product solution because you now see the psi dependence actually here and the eta dependence here it is a product. Okay, so you do not you do not have psi and eta mixing up with each other they are, they, are, they are separate but they are multiplying the, the functions containing them are multiplied with each other. And we also see that you have a e to the minus phi and square sorry e to the minus phi and squared eta that is an exponentially decaying term in eta. So what that basically tells us is as you now go to eta tending to infinity farther and farther from the Bernoulli lip this entire term is going to go away and you are now going to get a, a, a gamma that is only this, this term alright and gamma is nothing but beta normalized and beta is nothing but a uh, difference in normalized mass fractions and normalized mass fractions are this. So essentially it tells you that as you go further and further out the mass fractions are going to differ by a constant all right and the constant depends on two things nu and c. So now we have to think about what does what does nu and c basically mean they mean something very interesting nu is telling us y o not divided by w o nu o divided by y f not divided by w f nu f this has got nothing to do with the geometry of the problem it is got to do with our inlet mass fractions of oxidizer and fuel and their respective molecular weights and their stoichiometric coefficients in the reaction in the single step stoichiometric reaction okay. This is a stoichiometric reaction that means you do not have either fuel or oxidizer left over as part of the products. So what are the stoichiometric coefficients required for them to re react with each other completely right that is what is contained in this. So this is a mixture quantity and it is a inlet quantity because it has y f not and y o not. C on the other hand is purely a geometric parameter it tells you how small or large is the inner duct relative to the outer duct okay. So now you have to think about many different combinations is it possible for me to have a very small inner duct relative to a very large outer duct but send a high concentration of fuel inside when compared to a very diluted concentration of oxidizer outside let us suppose that that is one possibility. The other possibility I now have a fairly fat inner duct and just a little bit bigger outer duct that means most of the outer duct is contained by the inner duct and you are essentially trying to send a lot of fuel but let us suppose that the fuel is highly diluted but the oxidizer is highly concentrated what kind of flames will we get right on the one hand you are trying to send a very concentrated amount of fuel but in a very small region on the other hand you are sending in a lot of fuel all right but it is actually highly diluted is would, would you would you happen to have the same kind of flame right. So that is what this th this is going to dictate okay. So what are we going to look for in this what we want to see is interestingly this is now a gamma that is a function of eta psi and eta that means we should be able to plot gamma in this domain in where the mixing is happening and all we are looking for is look for gamma equal to 0 right as the stoichiometric surface which is essentially the flame shape. So that means if you are able to plot this particular function in the domain and have a contour map of gamma you now look for the gamma equal to 0 contour the iso 
contour of gamma equal to 0 corresponding to gamma equal to 0. So what does gamma equal to 0 mean right gamma equal to 0 means or beta equal to 0 if beta is equal to 0 then your alpha f equal to alpha o back here right. So gamma equal to 0 means beta equal to 0 beta equal to 0 means alpha f equal to alpha o and alpha f is nothing but minus y f by uh, w f nu f which is equal to minus uh, y o divided by w o nu o all right. So what this basically means is we want our y f by y o along gamma equal to 0 to be in the ratio of w f divided w f nu f divided by w o nu o right and what does that mean if I were to simply say nu f by nu o that would mean the stoichiometric ratio in terms of moles right all I have done here is to multiply nu f by w f and multiply nu o by w o so I am essentially looking at the mass ratio okay. So this is the mass ratio of stoichiometric proportions of fuel and oxidizer in a reaction for stoich for the for, for complete reaction to happen and what you are basically saying is when nu f by nu o anywhere in the domain is in this ratio you have a stoichiometric surface and that is what the flame is that is what the flame sheet assumption is that is what infinite chemistry means that is what mixed is burnt approach is all about right. So effectively it all translates to saying just look at the gamma equal to 0 contour all right. Further let us look at go back and see what nu is in the in the light of what we have done right. So this implies we can write or we can simply write this equal to nu o o divided by nu f o right divided by w o nu o divided by w f nu f. So what nu signifies is the incoming oxidizer fuel ratio by mass to the stoichiometric oxidizer fuel ratio by mass right. So effectively nu tells us something about what is coming into the domain relative to the stoichiometric mixture ratio and C tells us how much of what you are getting all right. So what you are then saying is we can, we can now we begin to do a few things here one um, how does the uh, height of the flame get determined right. So how, how does the flame look like what, what, what will happen if you now uh, try to plot this contour for gamma equal to 0 right. So depending upon the values of your nu and c right. So if you now say um, this is your psi equal to 1 psi equal to 0 and uh, you now fix your c as uh, psi equal to c that is where the inner uh, tube ends and then the outer tube is, is there you could now get a uh, flame that either looks like this or in fact we have a wall there you could have a flame that looks like that as you now change your new. So for different values so if you now fix your C at a particular value and change your new you can get the flame to close over the fuel or you can get the flame to open up and close over, close over the oxidizer open up from the middle and close over the oxidizer all right. So 
this is now called the overventilated flame and uh, this is what is called the underventilated right what does that mean it is essentially having a concept of ventilation as in opening up more air or uh, so when you now say over ventilated that means you have a lot of air when compared to fuel so the the flame is actually closing over the fuel and consuming all the fuel and if you now say under ventilated that means you do not have enough air so the fuel is spreading out and then mixing with whatever little air it can and then having and meeting it at stoichiometric proportions along this line that closes over the oxidizer and opens up over the fuel. So by, by this uh, what it means is if you now have a flame that looks like this you now have a fuel rich region over here or pretty much all fuel in the, in the actual case and outside is going to be oxidizer because the flame is separating the fuel and oxidizer and getting them to meet at stoichiometric proportions in between all right. So if you now have a under ventilated flame you are simply going to have a lot of fuel that is going to go out unreacted over here. So when would you expect a fuel rich uh, sorry uh, when, when would you expect a under ventilated flame or a over ventilated flame. So now think about th those two uh, limits that we were talking about. If you now have a very short duct for the inner duct very very small duct for the inner duct when compared to the outer duct and you have an infinite domain pretty much no matter how concentrated the fuel is relative to how dilute the oxidizer is you are very likely to have a, a, a flame that is closing over the fuel that means it is going to be an over ventilated case. If you now have a very very broad inner duct when compared to the outer duct being just a little bit bigger you are very likely to have a opened up flame that is under ventilated right. No matter how much you are diluting things but there is an effect of that and the, that effect is going to come up when you have you, you are at a 50-50 kind of situation that is you are neither too small nor too large. The message here is the, the, the slot width is going to dictate whether the flame is go, going to be uh, over ventilated or under ventilated more than new or in other words the far field behavior of the flame is more sensitive to C rather than new. So what is the job of new in this then you have to ask yourselves look at this picture this flame if you were now somewhere here you are just beginning to look at how this mixing is happening and then the flame is shaping up both of them are beginning to look pretty much the same they are going like that over the oxidizer starting from the fuel right but then as you keep going that went that way this went this way and then we now call those over ventilated that one under ventilated but why did they start going like that in the first place right why could not you have a flame that what that was like this that could have been a possible solution as well. So what is the difference between this and this this flame started going over the fuel and closed over the fuel whereas this flame started going over the oxidizer and then closed over the fuel this flame goes over the fuel and closes over the fuel. So you now have multiple possibilities you could have a flame that starts going over one of the ducts and then closes over the other or it goes over the same duct and closes over the same duct right. So what governs this is new when they are just beginning to mix and react they are just beginning to consume the reactants and it is the final 
large scale availability of reactants that is going to shape up how the flame is going to end up at, 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 as we go along and the large scale availability is dictated by the C how much fuel you have on the hole versus how much oxidizer you have. But locally as they just begin to mix and react they are not worried about that they are not worried about how they are going to end up when all the less deficient species is consumed reactant is consumed they are going to first be dictated by what is the new how how concentrated the oxidizer is relative to the fuel as it comes in relative to what their stoichiometric ratio demands. So if you had a fairly concentrated fuel but coming in a very very small uh, region it is going to actually go out in search of the oxidizer because oxidizer is dilute all right and ultimately you're, you as, as you go along you are having a short fuel duct a, a, a small fuel duct so you are running out of fuel and then it closes over. So you, you, can, you can see that the new dictates the near field behavior of the flame and the C dictates none, both of them are together it is like it is difficult to separate them but you look at the sensitivity right you look at the sensitivity of this the, the, the far field behavior of the flame uh, is more sensitive to C the near field behavior of the flame is more sensitive to new all right and then from this you can also find out what should be the shape of the flame. So what should be the combination of new and C together that will give rise to a optimally ventilated flame right a flame that is kind of like that but I just went too fast I did not tell you whether it is going like that or like this right that depends on the new what I am talking about is for a given new what should be the C such that the flame goes vertical and does it go to infinity we will talk about it later.